I'd like to call the meeting of the City Council Finance Committee to order for Monday evening, May 7th, 2018. It's about uh, just about 7.09 uh, p.m. Thank you uh, uh, all for being here this evening and um, welcome councilors and, and guests as, as well. As I ended, who blew up? As I indicated to you a few weeks ago, we would be here this evening, May the 7th, for our finance meeting, and we would also be here next Monday evening, uh, May the 14th, for our city council meeting, again, both at 7 o'clock uh, p.m. So the first items we have on the agenda are three streets, one, two, and three, and they are public hearings. First, I'm going to ask the uh, clerk to please call order number one. One, ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton required the laying out and acceptance of Gerald Avenue, extending from East Ashland Street southerly, a distance of about 1,031.32 feet, and for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way. Favorable in planning on April 3rd, 2018, invited Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development, Larry Rowley, Commissioner, DPW. And time having arrived, I'm going to declare the hearing open. If there is somebody here in favor of, which we have two invited guests, if you wish to come up and state their name to the clerk, please do so now. Commissioner? Lawrence Raleigh, DPW. Commissioner, um, we have no objections to this street. Very good. We're all set with it. Thank you. Anyone else here present in favor of? And that's in regards to Gerald there. Please come forward and state your name to the, to the clerk as well. Seeing none, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Anybody here in opposition? If there's anybody here in opposition, please come forward and state your name to the clerk. Seeing none, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Council O'Lally. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. Favorable recommendation. And that will be heard on next Monday evening. Item number two. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton required the laying out and acceptance of Connell Avenue extending from Court Street northerly to East Ashland Street, a distance of about 1,383 feet. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way favorable in planning on April 3rd, 2018. Invited Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development, Larry Rowley, Commissioner, DPW. And at this time, I'm going to declare the hearing open. If there's anybody here in favor, I'd ask them to please come up and state their name to the clerk. Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. We have no objections for, for this request. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Anybody else here in favor? I'd ask to come up and state your name to the clerk. Anybody else here in favor? Seeing none, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Anybody here in opposition? Is there anybody here in opposition? I'd ask you to come up and state your name to the clerk. Seeing none, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Council Lally. Motion has been made and seconded that we uh, move to recommend favorably to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. Item number three. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Leland Street, extending from Gerald Ave easterly to North Quincy Street, a distance of about 245.09 feet. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way. Favorable in planning on April 3rd, 2018. Invited Rob May, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Larry Rowley, Commissioner, DPW. Again, I declare this part of the hearing open. If there's somebody here in favor, please come up and state your name to the clerk. Lawrence Riley, DPW Commissioner. We have no objections for this request. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Anybody else in favor that wishes to be heard, please come up and state your name. Yep, come right up if you're in favor of. You can speak right into the microphone. Right. Just give your name. Uh, Paul Batolo, 5 Leland Street. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, the street's been private for how many years um, since my house was built? Pro probably a, a long time now. It's, it has There's only two houses on there. Can I keep it private the way it is? Why change it? Well, you, you can. Your, your council has put in for it to be accepted to be a, a public way. So um, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that particular area or, or its street. So um, I don't know, DPW Commissioner, is, is it a two-way? I don't know how many homes are up there. Do you? Two houses on the street. Just two houses on the street? That's it. 
Okay. And people use that to drag race for a short, oh, excuse me, a shortcut for back and forth. I'd like to make it a one-way street if I could. You'd, you'd like it to remain the, the one way? Uh, I would like to make it a one-way. I mean, you'd like to way. remain a private way, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. private way, yeah. yes. And yeah. if I could turn it into a one-way okay. to eliminate the traffic and the, you know, all the kids living on this. Okay, on so you're, you're, there. Right. you're in opposition too. Okay, well, it'll be taken under advisement and then I'll let the, the council make its decision at that point. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, anybody else here? Um, Again, uh, I didn't really close the hearing in favor. Obviously, they're, they're not in favor. Anybody here uh, in opposition as well? Anyone else that wants to be heard? Please come forward and uh, state your name. Seeing none, <laughs> Councilor Lally. Uh, I just want to. I just want to say I, I believe we we did talk on the phone about the road going forward and additionally uh, making this a one-way street. Uh, that is before the traffic commission for its next meeting. Uh, yes, you, you will receive a letter from me, uh, and rem not reminding, advising you of or inviting you to the traffic commission hearing uh, or meeting on May 8th. So I'll, I'll go deliver that to you. I believe the meeting is May 24th, the fourth Thursday of the month. Absolutely, yep. But I, this, this might be easier to do as a, as a public way. I know we did talk about uh, continuing forward with this as a public way. Are you all set with that, sir? You have a clear understanding of it? So it, it will be made a public way, but it will be a one-way street, which would be in your favor, I would believe, correct? It'll, it'll go before the traffic, traffic commission, commission so we can right. make the argument for why it should be a one-way street. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll push for that, too. All right. So okay. I, I move favorable. Councilor Sullivan, on the motion. I was always under the impression that, and I live on a private way, as does Attorney Nazarella, um, we wouldn't have any jurisdiction, we the City Council or the City of Brockton, to make a private way any condition such as a one way. Right. So the only, the only caveat, the only way that that could happen would be if it was accepted by the city to be a public way. Is that the purpose of the council? If there's only two people that live on the street, I'm just trying to figure out what the basis is. Exactly. I'm, is that I'm, the whole I'm, purpose, I'm Jack? Same treatment. At some point in the future, this will need to be paved. We might as well get this, you know, the legal matter out of the way, and this will allow it to become a uh, uh, one-way street. Yes. It, it won't. I understand what Councilor Sullivan is oh, saying. Yeah, I, it, sorry, it can yeah. become a public way, but but traffic may see it in a different tone that it may not become a one way. It may just say no, they want to leave it where it is. That's up to the traffic commission. Two right. separate two separate entities of what El eligible. Right. Eligible. Yes. So I'm sorry. Sir, is it, is it in regards to, I did close the hearing, but I'll allow you, if, if, is it in regards to the street? Come right up here. I live on Gerald Ave. My name is Paul Blanchard. Paul, okay, I'm yes. I'm 173, and what happens is, is Leland runs into Gerald Ave. It's a short street that comes from, comes from Quincy Street into Gerald Ave. This particular street is used as a cutoff. The people are going down Gerald Ave doing 60 miles an hour. We have other families there now that have moved in with children. There used to be a lot of retired people lived there. They've since moved out. Now you've got children there that are going to get run over by these cars coming down there. And if you made it a one way, the one way would come into Gerald Ave so they wouldn't use it as a bypass. I don't know if that's going to affect anything as far as public or private, but no one should get hurt. I understand. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. I understand. I, I, I think what we have before us probably should be, is there somebody else in one? No. Councilor on the, on the uh, If I could ask uh, motion. Commissioner Rowley to come up and basically just k kind of give us a, a, some clarification on that. I mean, what's this whole thing about in order for it to be considered um, a, um, I mean, for any consideration from the city itself, it has to be named uh, a public way? Correct. I think Councilor Sullivan said it like it. Even, even in order for it to be heard by the Traffic Commission, it has to be? Yes. It has, it to, has be. to be a public way. Okay. Yes. 
because private waste councils, we have no jurisdiction. The homeowners own to the middle of that street if it's a private way. All right. So, okay, that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Oh, sir. So the motion is on the floor to, to move it uh, to the full city council. Councilor Sullivan on the motion. Chairman, to the gentleman, I, I just want to make sure, because I, I just want to make sure you're clear, because I, I, I want to be clear. To the midpoint, under the law, to the midpoint. But that's correct, to the other midpoint, right? You own half, they own half. But I guess what I'm trying to just clarify is that you came in, you said you want to keep it private, but you also want it one way, and you, you, you can't do it both ways under the law. Well, if it's private, I own it. What am I right to do? I can't give you legal advice. I'm sorry. You can't. But I just want to make sure everyone is clear on that right, because right. we, the city council, the legislative body, we don't have the ability to make a road, a public way, then one way. That's the traffic issue. We don't have that ability. Right. I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. Exactly. I, I think we are. Uh, I don't think Councilor Cruz, I, I, I see you. Oh, I live on a private way, I can't do just that. To let you know, Councilor Cruz. Just to let you know, even though you own to the middle of the street, you can't make the decision on, on traffic flow of the street. That's a public safety issue that the traffic commission would only be able to do something about. And again, we can't consider it while it's a private way, but you couldn't close it off. You couldn't make it a one way on your own. You can't do anything like that because there are public safety issues to do with fire trucks, ambulances, that kind of thing. So even though you own to the middle of the street with that other person that's on the other side of the street, you don't have the right, I, I believe, and uh, Attorney Resnick may be able to back me up. It's, it's a private way for, some issues, but there you do not have the right to make decisions on the traffic flow, correct? Thank you. So the only way we can make it a private way, excuse me, a one way is for it to go before the traffic commission, and it can't go before the traffic commission while it's a private way. Right. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. So that's what we're doing tonight is accepting it as a public way, and that won't mean much of anything other than the fact that, it, that Councilor Lally has uh, put it on the agenda for the Correct? On the agenda for the... Uh, Thank you. So that, that, discussion, that discussion we'll have at the Traffic Commission, and which I, two of the councilors are on with the DPW Commission, the, somebody from the Fire Department, somebody from the Police Department. So that discussion... That's one of the things that Correct. you benefit from. Someday, the city also can't can't resurface a private way, so probably true. <laughs> so, but if we don't start that process, that's, I might your grandkids will be dead too. Yeah. So, okay, so, there, so the motion that's the motion that is before us is for it to be sent back to the uh, full city council um, with a favorable recommendation. All opposed. All in favor. All opposed. Goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation, and Council Lally will be in touch with you to to let you know definite on the, uh, the date and time and its location so that you can be there at the traffic meeting, you and others that, that uh, have involvement here, okay? Thank you, thank you. Item number four. Ordered, an act creating a parfic, uh, parking and traffic commission in the city of Brockton, postponed in finance committee on April 2nd, 2018. Invited, Rob Malley, executive director, parking authority. John Halsey, captain traffic commission. John Crowley, chief of police. Council Fowl. You and I met with the solicitor and some other people the other day. Yes. This is an evolving discussion. Uh, parking Authority will receive a presentation from me at some point. So I'm going to move to postpone this to a Finance Commission meeting in July. Very good. Meeting in July. Postponed to July. Motion has been made and second to postpone. All in favor? Item has been postponed. Item number five. Ordered that the City Council approve the proposed amendment to the current water purchase agreement between the City and Aquaria LLC. Postponed from April 17, 2018, Finance Committee meeting. Invited John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Phil Nisrala, City Solicitor, Shannon D. Resnick, City Council Legal Counsel. Good evening, Mr. Condon. 
Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Councilors. You're back in front of us. Yes. So yeah. this was the item that was postponed at the last uh, Finance Committee meeting, uh, which was an amendment to the current water purchase contract with Aquaria, which would reduce the fixed commitment from 4.07 million gallons a day to 3.81 million gallons per day. So save would, it would save the city some money and would allow the Aquaria company to avo avoid the investment necessary to ensure that the uh, pipeline across the bridges would be uh, capable of carrying the extra volume. So the council, I think, was not satisfied with the uh, certainty that the consideration in the contract was as favorable as it should have been to the uh, city, and so it requested that I go back and approach Aquaria to see if we can obtain some more concessions. I did do that. I provided over the last week a series of emails <coughs> which um, reflect the outcome of those discussions, and I provided uh, hard copy documentation of that. It should be on your, on your desk tonight. So basically, uh, I relayed the concerns of the City Council to Aquaria, and I suggested that the best way I could see to w remain within the current context of the contract and gain additional advantage to the city would be to further reduce that fixed commitment from 3.81 to 3.5. That would have gained about an additional million dollars a year in, in savings. Um, the Aquaria folks said that they were not able to do that. This happened over discussions and then later in formal communications. And their reasoning for that was that the um, loan agreements that they have in connection with that project have covenants in them which have to do with the amount of revenue to cover certain fixed costs and coverage for their uh, loan repayments. And that kind of amendment would violate those covenants and therefore they weren't able to act on it. Uh, I then asked if instead they could consider reducing uh, or deferring the producer price index escalation that applies to the rate that gets applied to the fixed commitment and the variable rates. Uh, they provided the same answer to that. They checked with the loan documents and again said the covenants would be violated with that kind of reduction in, in revenue. So we were stuck at that point. They did offer to give us for a couple of months a half a million gallons a day of free water under the variable rate and I provided that information to the city council and I await your decision. Take your questions. Questions, uh, councilors? Councilor Fowle. Mr. Condon provided to us today. And I've tried to take a step back from this and not get into the history of how cooperative Aquaria was or anything else. From all that I've read, and I went back and I watched the meeting of April 17th, from all that I've read and all that I've heard, Aquaria was supposed to be capable of pumping 4.07 million gallons per day as of the beginning of this calendar year. And from all that I heard on the tape, they can't do that. And I think they actually have to be a little more than 4.07 because I think in June, July, and August, we can ask for an extra half a million gallons a day. So that would put it up to, I think, 4.12 gallons per day. Mr. Conan was asked by Councillor Lally about, I strike that, I think by Councillor Cruz, whether Aquaria could uh, deliver 4.07 million gallons per day. And he indicated, uh, and, and uh, Councillor Cruz mentioned that I, I, I take it that they want to negotiate with us because they can't. And Mr. Condon replied, uh, we don't know that. And then he mentioned that they had pumped 4 million gallons per day at one point. And that's true. They pumped 3.986 million gallons in August of 2017. And that was at 23 minutes, 24 seconds on the tape that anybody can watch. And I'm mentioning this because these aren't my words. This isn't my opinion. This isn't something that's just floating around out there. This is what was represented to us on tape. And then at some point, Commissioner Raleigh was asked about whether can they pump 4 million gallons? And Commissioner Rowley at 26 minutes 40 seconds said he did not think so and that they would have to do some investments, pipeline over the bridge and an extra pump needed. And then at the very end of the meeting when we had had quite a bit of discussion, 
Mr. Condon was asked about by Council Monaghan about going back and negotiating. And he said, well, you know, we, it never hurts to go back and ask. And then his comment was, I've got to reassure them, we won't put you in default by going to four, which I assume is four million gallons per day. And that was at one hour, 19 minutes, and 30 seconds. You've heard me say before that people don't expect us to come in here and make every decision perfectly. But I think they send us here to look out for their interests. I think they send us here to protect their assets, their tax dollars, the money they pay in for water consumption. And I am beside myself trying to understand why, if Aquaria can't go to 4.07 million gallons per day as of July 1st, someone wouldn't have stepped forward and told us that. Instead, we backtrack, and now we want to cut them a deal so they don't have to do that. And I just don't get it. I would think that if you're the mayor, the CFO, even the DPW commissioner, the city solicitor, I would be on a vendor knowing that their performance standards were going to be raised to 4.07 million gallons per day. I'd be on them saying, I want assurances you're going to be able to meet that requirement. I mean, we've met every requirement they expect of us. We faithfully paid the money. We've been a cooperative client. Part of the reason why I think they have this financial dilemma of having to have a certain revenue to, to uh, uh, debt ratio is that they can't find another customer. I don't know what they've done to do that, but we've got two attorneys in this body. I'm not an attorney. I've sat around enough of them, so some of the good th things have rubbed off on me, some of the bad have rubbed off on me. But however you slice it, they're in default. I do not believe that they can pump 4.07 million gallons per day as evidenced by Mr. Condon's statement that will assure them we won't put them in default by going to four. So what would the remedy be? You know, because it's always easy to sit here and criticize. What, what should our next step be? Because I'm not going to support the modification. In my opinion, the next step would be file a resolve and have someone come in here from Aquaria. I'd like to talk to them face to face. The second thing is send them to arbitration. Under Article 18 in the Water Services Agreement, if you have a dispute between the parties, you go to an arbitrator. Actually, I think it calls for two arbitrators if I've read Section 18 properly. Now, that's not hugely expensive. That's not hiring $500 you know, or outside counsel. I've been to arbitrations. I've testified in arbitrations. I certainly know Attorney Nesrallah and his staff are very capable of handling an arbitration maybe with some outside technical help, but I just don't think that we should roll over and give them what they want for $455,000 a year. And by the way, on a $406 million budget, $455,000 is .00112%. So someone might say, well, where are you gonna get the money? Well, you don't have to fill positions at the police department that aren't needed, civilian positions. I don't think we had to spend $68,000 to have a legal report done that we didn't retaliate against a gentleman who apparently has won every motion, he won a case against us and he's won every motion that's gone into court so far. But I don't want to hear from people, well, we can't pass up the $455,000. Something isn't right about this whole situation. Something isn't right with Aquaria. They should have been prepared on January 1st to meet the provisions of this contractual agreement. And if they can't do that, that's not my problem. My issue is protecting the taxpayers and the people who send us here who ought to believe that we will stand up for them and say, no, we're not going to make it easy for a vendor. So no slight against Mr. Condon, no slight against anyone who negotiated with them, but this isn't right, folks. The, the, and I'll let the attorneys on the council comment. Th they are in default. They are not meeting the provisions of that agreement. And that's not right. And if it were reversed, if we didn't do that, you can be sure that they would be legally 
advancing their case against the city. And the last thing I would say is, and I'm not picking on big corporations, I guess it's owned by a Korean corporation now, but who steps forward for the homeowner in Ward 2, or Ward 4, or Ward 6, who maybe has a death in the family and the widow has only one income? Do we cut them a break in their taxes? No, we say, you know what, you've got a commitment to us. You have to pay your quarterly taxes, and if you don't, after a while, we're going to take you to tax title. So I'm not about to make it easy for Aquaria. I don't think they can do what they're supposed to do. And if we go to arbitration, the relief sought would be force them to pump 4.07 million gallons for three months and show us they can do it. The equipment is now 10 years old. If you look at their public report that they have to file every year, all of the pumps were to 2008. It's now 2018. So if I seem hard, I'm sorry. But contract law is contract law, agreements are agreements and integrity still ought to mean something in today's world. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Counselor, Counselor Derencourt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes. Thank you, Mr. Conan, for coming down. Um, I myself cannot possibly think about supporting this, given the fact that I think um, it is the responsibility of Aquaria to provide the services that we need in the city based on that water. So here's my issue. Um, they come up with that $455,000 you know, with the expectation of not providing that 4.07 uh, million gallons of water a day. So I think it is their responsibility to find out whether or not they are willing to do it. I can understand that sometimes, you know, the expectation based on the contract would not be uh, possible for them to do this, giving the explanation that Mr. Wally gave, according to the pipes, may not be able to kind of like um, handle the water. But I think um, we as elected officials in this city, our job is to make sure that the money that we are spending um, on behalf of our residents are spent accordingly. And I think the issue that I do have with this is that um, when this contract was um, sort of like signed, I wasn't here. And fortunately, I'm here now. And this contract will not be expired if I'm not one until 2027. So as we speak, um, according to them, they are not able to provide the amount of water that we need or they are not able to provide that 4.07 million gallons and unwilling to actually increase the amount of money. So I think um, it is their responsibility um, to do what, is the, um, what we think is best for them. And of course, my colleague, Council File, just said it. If we were at fault, I believe they would have been thinking about suing the city as we speak. And I think that um, because they are unwilling to change that uh, 455 thousand um, dollars a year I think there's something wrong within this so um, I don't believe this is justice to our city I don't believe Aquaria um, truly respect our desire to serve the public um, I am a fair person I believe in giving opportunities but I think that in this particular case it is wrong because obviously uh, we are making our payment if I'm not wrong we probably do it um, you know accordingly so why can't they come up with a policy or a deal that will actually allow us to do something positive? I am more than willing to actually give them a chance in terms of like not able to provide that uh, 4.07 million gallons. But with that uh, $455,000 a year, I don't think this is a good deal for the city. And of course, um, I think the administration should think about the consequences. I mean, obviously, it is their job to know whether or not they are willing, um, they were willing to do it. So when they were, signing this contract, it seems like they didn't know it, this issue could have been a problem, given the fact that now they're coming back saying that um, we don't believe we will be able to provide it due to our pipe situation. I mean, I know that it's not just pipes. I don't really know all the language behind it. But I think it is very unjust to our residents to know that, as we speak, they are not only unable to provide that 4.07 million gallons a day, but they are unwilling to make a deal um, that will sort of like benefit our city. I think this is very disrespectful, not just to us as um, elected officials, but to the residents. I am, I am, I'm sick and tired of this, you know, deal with Aquaria because the thing is that we postpone this solely to give them an opportunity to do something about it. And obviously you do your best to reach out to them. And according to um, the letter they sent you, although I just came through it, it seems like they are unwilling to bend. And it is not our job to find out what's best for them. It is their job to find out what is best for our city. 
and I hope that some of my colleagues will definitely vote against this to make sure that they, fa they, they follow through accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Nicastro. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Um, I'm one of those attorneys, and I, I have more questions on this amendment. Um, and so I had a look at the, the paperwork you sent, specifically the information from Mr. Creedon at the Water Commission. And I note that in 2015, the city used 70,825,000 gallons. In 2016, which was a drought year, we used 248,947,000 gallons. Um, in 2017, we used 235,933,000 gallons. I'm interested to know, in these three years, what was the percentage of overall consum of, of what percentage of overall consumption was this water? How much water did we use from Aquaria versus from Silver Lake and our other sources, and what, so what percentage of our overall consumption did you're these asking, numbers You're asking me that question, Councilor? Pardon? You're asking me that question? Yeah, I'm asking you. I don't know the answer to that question. I think the data indicated what the, what the flows were from the various sources, but I'm not the water commissioner, I'm not the water manager. I don't manager. think the data indicated that. No, I think it, I, I understood it was only from Aquaria, what you sent from Brian Creedon. Okay. Okay? So it's a very technical question, but I'd really like to know. I also note that in 2017, we used water through the, we used Aquaria water through the entire month of May, and yet now this amendment is asking us to take off the month of May, and so I'd like to know why. Um, also, on the amendment in, in uh, paragraph number two, um, I don't understand why the Beaudry permits, which are the permits you're getting to keep the fish eggs from going mm -hmm. into the intake valve, I believe, why would they diminish the city's right to get water elsewhere? And why would these permits include restrictions on our right to withdraw water? I have very technical questions, and I don't understand why I'm asking the city CFO those questions, respectfully. Um, also, it goes on to say that in addition to the days when we can't, or then we can't, that they can't provide us with water, but we can't call it a breach. We're going to add 40 days, according to this amendment, to the additional in, uh, days that are listed in the original contract. Well, what do we do if we need water in those 45 plus days? I'd, I'd like to know the answer to that. What do we do if we get in a jam with Silver Lake and we don't have water? Um, this is supposed to be a backup source of water, and yet we tend to use 10 or 11 million gallons per day, but yet this, can only, this is only going to provide us with 3.8 million gallons per day. It doesn't seem like it's the definition of a back, backup source of water, but I wasn't there when this deal was cut so many years ago. Um, I need some technical advice about all of this, and I need it from not Camp Dresser and McGee, which gives technical advice to the city on other matters. I need it from an independent source of information. Um, I would love to see us create a committee so that we can fairly and impartially analyze this contract and this amendment. I, I feel at a deficit without that kind of information. I went back and, read and watched the, uh, the video on YouTube of our meeting on April 17th. And and you did say that, that you, you were going to tell them that we would forbear, which leads me to believe we are in default. They are in default. And so I wonder, what are our remedies? I've spoken with the chair about getting a legal op opinion about what are the city's remedies, given that they're in, they're in default. I mean, we can go to arbitration, but I'd like to see something done. Also, the, uh, the Department of Public Utilities annual report that was filed by Aquarian noted that their mortgages were going to be paid off last year, one in June and one at the end of the year, December 31. So I'm wondering, they've freed up a substantial amount of money. Right. Why aren't they sending some of it our way, being that we're their only customer and we've stood by them all these years? Um, I know you can't answer that, and I, I know you feel you've given an answer to that, but I don't, un I don't understand why, why and why their debt ratio requires all these things. Um, I would like to see us postpone this conversation until after our budget <coughs> talks are over to see where the city stands fiscally, see what kind of money we really have. Um, um, and, and also, you talked about 
and Mr. Rowley chimed in about how that water comes in every day to keep those pipes clean and that it is dechlorinated and it's dumped. Well, where is the process of dechlorination taking place? And also, why are we dumping that water? Why aren't we putting it into our water system for use instead of just throwing it away? I, I don't understand. So for all these reasons, I don't feel like I'm in a position to vote on this amendment. And if I'm forced to, I'll have to vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chair. Council of Monaghan. Yes. Um, I think the basic thing of this is, ba they might be a little bit out of, out of compliance, but they are allowed to fix the problem and become in compliance. That's part of the uh, contract. Uh, what we're voting on basically is either we take the money and allow them, we don't need the $4 million uh, gallons a day right now, so we really don't need it. So it's basically this amendment, take the money each year, if they need to, if we need that um, to be upgraded to get the four million a day, we can do that. But basically what's gonna happen is either we take the money, go along with the agreement, I think it's the best that uh, uh, Mr. Conner could come up with, or we just hold them to their, um, the contract. That's basically it. It's either we're gonna let them go, be, uh, be able to upgrade it to four million gallons a day, and we go on paying as we have been for the past how many years? So that's only the options there. We, we're talking a lot of stuff here, but basically it's either let them, keep, let them upgrade it, or we agree to this and we get $455,000 a year. That's basically the gist of it, as far as I can see. I don't, I don't know why, we're getting a lot of technical questions, but I'm just saying there's a lot of stuff in that contract that was already negotiated. You want to look at the contract, that's fine, but I think what's before us is basically hold them accountable, make them go to the four million, or we'll, 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 uh, we'll give them, uh, they'll give us $455,000 a year and they don't have to upgrade. I mean, that's, that's basically it. I don't think there's a heck of a lot else to talk about unless I'm missing something here. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm not done yet. Councilor Sullivan. We're over here too, thank yeah. you. <laughs> goes, goes my turns. First of all, thank you. Thank you for, you know, you stand up here and you get bashed. You're not Aquaria, and believe me, out of everybody on the city council, I'm the one that despises Aquaria the most. <laughs> and uh, just for the new councilors, I filed a resolve when Jim Harrington was mayor. I filed a resolve when Linda Balzotti was mayor. They thumbed their nose each and every time. When Bill Coppin became mayor, I filed a resolve. It died because of new legislation. Two years, they thumbed their nose, all these excuses. Finally, uh, they came when Councilor Rodriguez, to his credit, and the council agreed to cut and not fund the budget. So, you know, Council Fowler, you can follow a resolve, they're gonna just laugh at us, it's a joke. Um, I, I read this, um, I read this letter, and uh, first of all, I was amazed that the, <laughs> that the Mass DEP uh, encourages you to continue this level of excellence, extends its congratulations for an outstanding performance. That was in April, April 10th, my mother's birthday. I mean, that's a joke in itself, a joke. These people, say they're partners, they're not partners of ours. I mean, they found a windfall with us because we were forced to have a secondary water source many years ago, that's what it is. So we're, we're their uh, pot of gold under the rainbow. Um, they've never wanted to be our partner, I mean, it was clear by not appearing before us. Um, that they only have one customer of the city of Brockton is clear, they're not marketing. When I asked the guy, he didn't even know what the MMA conference was, I mean, it's a joke. Um, with that being said, um, you know, uh, Mr. Conant, have, have, and you probably haven't because I'm sure it's privy, but have you ever seen this credit report with Santander? Yeah, I, and, and they wouldn't show it to you even if, if you know, even if you requested. Now, uh, section two of this letter dated April 30th, it says Aquaria would be in default with the lender, meaning Santander. Well, they're in default with the city of Brockton, their partner. Uh, I mean, it's clear. Uh, the joke right here is Aquaria has worked cooperatively with Brock as a partner in this project and was always looking for ways that we could benefit both parties. That's BS. The only benefit they're trying to get is to, to, to make sure the money comes in from the city of Brockton. Now, as a lawyer, I can say they've, they've breached. Um, they've breached since January. I mean, that's five months. There's been a breach there. Um, but sitting up here, I, I'm not a lawyer for the city council. I'm not a lawyer for the city of Brockton. I just think that you know, we need, we meaning the legislative body needs to do our homework on this. They're coming to us because they can't adhere to the contract. It's clear. They can't. Now, 
Mr. Monahan saying, you know, it's take it or leave it to 450. I was called by a school committee member over the weekend saying that a promise was made that if the city council agrees to this 450, the mayor has agreed. I wasn't there, but I was told by the school committee member that it's on tape that that 450 is going to go to the schools to save jobs. Now, first of all, it can't because there's an enterprise fund. Money is drawn from the general fund, so I guess you could argue the savings would go back to the general fund. But that was a call that I got by someone that is an elected, you know, official trying to do what's right. Um, I, you know, I, I, I just don't think that that's the way to do business. You know, we're in the people <clears throat> business to help the people. Aquaria doesn't care about the residents that we represent. They only care about the money. So we, meaning the city council, we need to figure out what is the next step. And under the contract, and I wasn't on the council when they had adopted this and executed this either, but under the contract, both parties, a good faith negotiation, meeting of the minds, it's, it's legally bound, we have obligation to pay, they have obligation to provide service. They can't meet that. It's clear, they can't. So what are the next steps? Sue them for breach, well arbitration would come into effect before that. So I, I, I think that we need to work with our legislative council because that's why Shannon's here. She's a great lawyer, she can work with us. Uh, city solicitor as well can work with Attorney Resnick, but at the end of the day, I'm not gonna ever have my hands tied and my feet to the fire by Aquaria because they're not a good partner, they're not a good business, and obviously they don't know what the heck they're doing because they're losing money. They're in the red every single year. So to say, hey, City Council Sullivan, if you don't vote for this, it's gonna screw the schools and they're not gonna get the 450, I didn't appreciate that either. I wasn't there, Jay, I'm sure you were there. I'm sure there was a disconnect there between what people heard and what was said. It's quite to that point. Yeah. Council. If yeah. I might comment on that part, I, yeah. I was at that meeting. I think that there's a lot of concern in the school department about getting additional revenues yep. to their budget. The mayor is sympathetic to doing that. He indicated that there were city council cuts and if this were approved, this would be a potential cut because the 455,000 would be in the budget so that it's fully funded. So, so would the full 450 go to the schools? Was no, that an accurate no, statement? Was, no, I think his statement was he would be inclined to look at any cuts that the city council made to the budget and to try to get as many of those back into the council's hands for appropriation. And this particular one would require two steps because it is possible for them to reimburse the general fund for expenses in our budget that the water department isn't paying for yep. and then the council to appropriate, appropriate that to the schools. But I don't think it was ever intended that there would be a direct move water budget to the school department yeah, but it, it, there's no doubt the mayor was concerned and looking to be as helpful as he could be to get more money than he's able to get to get into their budget at the moment and i think we're all concerned i mean everybody yeah. up here is concerned yeah. but 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 the, the statement made to me was if you agree to that 100 percent of that's going to go to the schools yeah I, and i don't think that's accurate I, I, you'd have to ask the mayor if yeah. that was his intent I, okay. I didn't quite interpret it that way so councils again i mean i, I don't have any questions for mr Conn, and i mean I, we have questions <coughs> for the people that should be here and they never are and they never will so, you know, when, when Moses made that motion and we cut it, I mean, they, they finally stepped up to the plate. They flew into Brockton and, you know, because they were losing, you know, potentially losing their funding source. So I think, you know, we need to stand pat. We need to stand tight. Uh, we need to figure out with our attorney uh, what the steps are because there are steps. There is a process. But they are, without question, in my humble opinion, in breach of a contract that's legally binding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I just will have to reiterate, I listened to Councilor Farwell and, and I agree with him completely, except that we get to a different, a different ending at, at the end. I keep hearing about disrespect from Anima or whatever they are now, Bluestone, whatever, whatever name they're going under now. And to me, I couldn't care less about that. Are they a good partner? They're probably the worst partner we've had since I've been serving on this council. And uh, even though there are people out there in the internet land that think I was here at the time, <laughs> I wasn't here either when this uh, contract was made. But I have listened to complaints from almost every taxpayer and voter in this city over the last 10 years about paying for water that we're not using. We have an opportunity to fix some of that right now. And as much as does it benefit them, maybe it does. I couldn't care less. They're a business. They're not here to worry about us, and I'm not here to worry about them. The bottom line is we have, uh, we, I'm hearing talk about them being in breach of contract. Almost certainly, and I'm not a lawyer, and I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night, but <laughs> almost certainly a judge would not throw the contract out the window. He'd say, spend that three or four million dollars, get it up to code, and then yeah. give the ability 
to pump the 4.08 or wherever we're at next. So that's wonderful. We make them spend that money, which is great. We then have to buy more water that we're not using. I don't get, again, Councilor Farwell and I, we take steps one through five, we're on the same boat. The difference, different reading after that, though, is that's all that we're going to do if we force them, and I believe we can force them. We'll force them to spend that money, change those pumps, upgrade what, where the uh, plant is, and then we will owe more money than we have an opportunity to spend right now. Again, does it help them? Maybe it does. I couldn't care less. It helps my taxpayers. That's what I'm looking at. So again, I agree with 90% of what each one of you is, is thinking. But instead of, instead of being penny wise and pound foolish, I think we owe it to the taxpayers to take that step and say, great, let's step back from the precipice of spending another $450,000 a year for water that we're not using. And we're paying for that water just be, because we have to. Here's an opportunity to save some of that money and I think we're foolish not to take it. But I, I can clearly see it's not going to pass, so we'll just spend that, we'll make them spend three and a half million dollars, whatever it is, upgrade the plant, and then we'll be paying for water that we're not using. So just let's all remember next year, let's not be sitting here saying, oh, I can't believe the water budget has us paying for water we're not using. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President and Mr. Thank Chairman. You, uh, thank you, Councilor. Any other councils? Councilor uh, Rodriguez? Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, too, want to chime in, and, I, and there's no reason for any of us to repeat what was said, uh, both at the last meeting and what's been said here today. But one of the things that I am bothered by is the fact that Aquaria knows that they're basically in the intensive care unit right now. And when it comes to... They're telling us that they're at this point that they're actually in the intensive care. So my question to us is, if I was a business owner and I knew that my life depends on what you guys would do as a body, don't you think that I would be here even sitting in the bleachers so that when you have some questions, some technical questions, even if you're not asked to appear, because I know that there's a, this whole technicality behind, ah, we, we didn't ask him to come or whatever the deal is. But if I was Aquaria and I know that my lifeline through this council is sitting at this meeting in the sense, I would be sitting in the bleachers here, you know, just so that I could say, I, I can answer that question for you. Especially when they know the kind of reputation that they've had with this body. I know Councilor Cruz last week said something about not, you know, not caring about feelings being hurt. It's not that you can't hurt my feelings. I grew up in the, middle, in the middle of a civil war in Angola. You can't hurt my feelings whether or not you show up or don't show up. But when the taxpayers of this community are paying you religiously almost $7 million a year, to me they're a business. And a business needs to respect the fact they need to know where that funding is coming from. And the fact that the people's representative ask them. Now, mind you, I believe in, when Council, filed, uh, Council Sullivan filed that resolve, it was a mere question to find out whether or not they actually had done the advertising that they had talked about in the contract. That's all we wanted to know in the beginning. Yeah. It says in the contract that you're supposed to spend $250,000 advertising this to other communities, have you done that? It took two years to get that answer. And I think it was after we finally said, enough is enough, we're not gonna do that. So again, I come back with, and I hear that <clears throat> if they go ahead and upgrade the system to produce the water that they need to produce, that now we're gonna have to buy the water that we don't need, that's not true. Their job is to, is to make sure that that plant's ready to produce 4 million gallons when the city needs it. And it has to be up to 4 million gallons. If we don't have to buy 4 million gallons, we don't have to buy 4 million gallons, but that plant needs to be prepared to deliver 4 million gallons when the city calls for it. So this whole notion that, oh my God, we better, we better take this, 
because if we don't, we're going to get stuck buying all this water. We don't have to buy the water. Just like we haven't bought water in the past few months because we haven't needed the water. We, that plant is, to be, is supposed to be on the ready. It's almost like a 911 system. When the city needs water, we press that button and they deliver water. That's what that contract was for. So the mere fact that now it's either take the $450,000, which in reality, if you sit down and think about it, that's nothing out of the six point something million dollars that they're getting, or we're gonna get stuck buying the water. No, that's not true. You know, their job is to, is to be on the ready to provide us with the water. Whether or not we buy it or not is a different story. If we don't need it, we don't buy it. You know, and it has to be clear that we have, we, we have to demand the fact that I am sure if the city was, you know, facing the difficulties that they're facing and we, we, we call them and say, listen, uh, we can't really give you six and a half million dollars this year. Can we do, can I give, can we give you five and a half? Because that's all we can generate. I don't think we will be hitting, you know, sitting here talking about this. So why is it that they're having the difficulties that they're having when the city is running through, through the difficulties that we're running, we're willing to bail these guys out basically and say, yeah, do whatever you want to. If you can do it, fine. If not, listen, instead of spending your three, three something million dollars, let us, let us get $450,000 out of that and you can do whatever you need to do. Because you know what? What's gonna happen two, three, four, five years from now when those upgrades were supposed to be in place? There's gonna be some instances where we're not even gonna be able to get a dime of water from these people. And that's what we need to stand by. But the fact is that we had an they have an opportunity to, co to come before this body and plead their case. I and mean, we've got our CFO and a solicitor who are supposed to be here on behalf of the city, not on behalf of the vendor. They're supposed to be, you know, to sit here and, and flash out numbers that we need from the bleacher seats. You know, the person at the podium should have been the president of Aquaria. But where's, the, where's Aquaria? Where's Aquaria in terms of the city of Brockton? They never cared. They were not going to care. They're going to continue to treat us this, this way. And bailing them out from this standpoint is a waste of our time and energy. $450,000, to be honest with you, is a lot of money when you're looking at the, uh, uh, the financial difficulties that we have. But as far as Aquaria is concerned, it's peanuts. They can do a lot better than that. If those numbers were in the millions, we can sit down and have a conversation. But just the way it is, $450,000, um, they don't have a vote. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Council O'Lally. All right. I'll be quick, I promise. Okay. Um, I think that we're, we're running the risk of, you know, cutting off our nose to spite our face. The, the money that we're talking about, to, to some degree, we do have to pay. Uh, we have to pay for, you know, the permission to draw the millions of gallons a day, whether or not we do draw those millions of gallons, which I think is, is ridiculous, but that's still what the contract is. Um, and additionally, we have to, we have to buy some of that water. In the agreement that we have made with, uh, you know, with the state, the state came in and they took a look at Silver Lake and Mont Ponce Pond and they said uh, that, you know, we have to work on a water, a plan for our water resources. How will we handle these things in the future? What will we do going forward? And we did commit to buying water from Aquaria. I don't remember how much, but I do know that we committed to buying a certain amount of water from Aquaria. So this does directly, you know, we are going to have to do this regardless. We might as well move forward with an option that will at least benefit the city. You know, this more than, more than shooting it down, accepting this benefits us and it benefits, you know, the DPW and the city so we can make necessary repairs going forward for this next year. Thank you, Council. Any other councils that have not yet been heard? I'm gonna go back to Council Monahan. Um, and then I think Darren Court was asked, go ahead. Council? Oh, you need Mr. Condon, okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Jay, if, we, if they upgrade to the four million, 
what, does, what are we going to have to pay for? Are I'm we going to have to buy more water? What's the deal? No. How is this going to cost? I, I think both Councillor Rodriguez and Councillor Cruz were right because there were two different portions of that contract that governed the payment. In terms of the fixed payment, which is based, it's a rate times a volume, we must pay that every year by the contract. And this reduction from 4.07 to 3.81 would save money in that fixed contract payment. That's for sure, that's just mathematics. In terms of actually buying water, because what that fixed commitment does, it secures the capacity of that plant to be available for us and nobody else. What the variable piece does though, is if you want water on any particular day, you call them up and you say, I want water, how much, they send it down and we have to pay for that water. We have no obligation to make any buy, or we can make a buy all the way up to the amount that they're capable of producing and are obliged to produce. So those, those two things are slightly different. Um, if you're looking to prove the breach by actually defaulting them, I think you'll have to buy water because you'll have to ask them to produce and for them to demonstrate that they're not able to produce and they have cure periods on the contract and they, you know, the cure is going to be to make the investment. So I don't know how the calendar and all that would work out and I'm not an attorney, but it wouldn't be our win on day one. It would take some proving for that to be the case and it would take some spending of the money for that to be the case. So I can fully understand all the frustrations that um, this council feels. I can also understand the reluctance to move ahead in an effort to make a, another deal with Aquaria based on the history. I can understand all of that. I think the decision you have to make is whether you think it's worth it to try that, as Councilor Monahan and Councilor Cruz have said, or if you'd rather say, I really don't want to make this deal. I just don't think it's in our best interest because of the partners not really being a partner, and we'll, we'll deal with the consequences after that. You've also got the option of never testing it paying for the fixed commitment, not buying the water to test to see if they actually be in a default. You've got that option as well. I don't know if that's the smartest option. I think if you're going to disapprove the, the amendment, we probably ought to test it to see if they could produce because you've already committed yourself to paying the extra money for the fixed commitment. To do that, um, basically if you want to buy four million gallons of water a day for the whole year, it's about four million dollars and I think we're in past years, we put a million to two million dollars in the budget, which just allows us to buy significant blocks of water from them, but not continuously for the whole year. Uh, so that, that's the option. I think probably, I think we maybe got a million and a half dollars in the budget we're working on right now to submit to you. Uh, that would probably allow you to buy four million gallons a day for, I don't know, 90 days or 120 days to see if they were able to produce. And, and if you thought you'd default them by doing that, we'd see. So, I mean, that. That, that's all I have to offer. I'm, yeah. I'm not the DPW commissioner, I'm not an attorney. I've just done the best I can on this. Some of the questions that uh, Councilor Nicastro asked, I don't have the answer to now. I know some of them, I think there's a fairly clear, simple answer to. For the most part, they've been a very small portion of our usage on a daily basis from the time that contract was first let. At the very beginning, we bought more than we have lately, uh, but it's clear we're taking maybe 10 million gallons a day, Larry, out of Silver Lake roughly between Silver Lake and Avon, and every now and then these guys throw us a million bucks. So over the course of a year, I would think it's less than 10%, probably well less than 10% of our volume that they buy. Uh, I didn't understand the question you have with respect to uh, a no breach time in May. I thought the way the contract amendment was worded, it would take that May period and work it in as one of the uh, maintenance periods where they wouldn't be in default as opposed to be an additional one. I'd have to look at that again because I don't think that's your intent to gain an, an additional benefit there. It's looked, it looked to me to be try to be integrated with that. So that's, that's a, and that's not a financial concession. So I don't think that's one that if you decided to go ahead, we'd have a hard time gaining from them to be certain that it doesn't, it doesn't implicate our, uh, our ability to have no more than five interruption periods. Those are in the contract so they can do maintenance. Uh, the reason for May is that's when the fish spawn and we knew there would probably be maintenance periods anyway. So we give them a maintenance period in May, it doesn't really affect us. Oftentimes we do take water out of Silver Lake in that period or out of Aquaria to benefit Silver Lake in that period. Larry can answer this better, but I don't think it's really critical that we do it at that time. When we negotiated that contract amendment, we checked with Larry about that. He had, he had no problems with the month of May. The reason we do it then is I think lots of times at that time they're doing hydrant flushing and that's 
that's convenient time to take their water. There are some other questions that I think, you know, you're looking for an independent review, and you'd be better off getting that from somebody that's uh, not a CFO, but, but some engineering and attorneys. But, so I've, I've given you the best I can on all of this. Okay. Uh, and can I have Mr. Raleigh for a second? I'll allow you to sit there. The amount of, that we don't, do we, we don't need to go with that four, four million gallons with a query right now. We're fine with what we're getting right now. You don't see any need for that, right, the increase right now? No, right now the uh, Silver Lake is full. And like Mr. Connor just said, usually the month of May, um, the lake is full. I just like to run it like I did last week for four days because we were flushing. So it's just, it, it flushes the, you know, this system's always flushed anyway, but then when it's coming into Brockton, we open hydrants from flush it that way, so. Right, we don't need them to go to the four million gallons. We can, we can go fine without, without that, we, we're fine. Correct. Okay. Yeah, our right. usage right now is down through, throughout the whole city. I mean, over the weekend, we used just about nine million gallons over the weekend, mm -hmm. a day. All right, okay, thanks, sir. So, I mean, basically, we hate Aquaria. They've, they've mistreated us. They've, they've disrespected us. They haven't been a good partner. But we, it's a simple fix. They're going to either upgrade if we don't accept the money, or we can accept the money, and they can get out of upgrading for right now. If we need them to upgrade down the road, they will. So we have a this budget coming up, the school's down eight and a half million dollars. I don't know what the city budget is. We haven't seen that yet. But I don't think it's a big, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer to me. Yeah, it's, it's, it, at this time, take the money. People, uh, people are complaining about taxes, water rates, what have you. $450,000 is a lot of money to go back into the schools or half or whatever it's going into. But I don't see where we lose. You're either going to upgrade. We're not going to win any contract uh, violations. It's, they're just going to fix, go up to the four million. That's it. Or we just let them, we'll let them do it. Or we could take the four hundred fifty-five thousand dollars. I don't think that's a it's a big problem, and I'll be voting for it. So thank you, thank you, Mr. Councilor. Councilor. <coughs> let's let's go to Councilor Darrancourt, then uh, Councilor Fowl. Back. You, can we imagine in terms of why Aquaria is unwilling to increase that money? Because I, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong, I think last meeting, my goal was to actually see that for, you know, $455,000 go a little bit higher. And, and if they do increase that, I'd be more than happy to support it. But let's face it, as of right now, they are facing a challenge. And it is their responsibility to understand it. And of course, my colleague, Council Wedgegress, just mentioned it. So, if they are facing this challenge, and all we are asking for, if I'm not wrong, is for more money, why can't they give it to us? I don't want to speak for them, Councillor. Okay, so I, 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 think, I, I, can't, I think I can't offer anything but what I've offered in, in the record. No, I mean, you know, I truly appreciate everything that you've been doing, and I know you've been doing an amazing job. And I think, to go back to what Moses just said, it would have been awesome or great to actually have someone from them to actually answer that question. Because let's face it, if, you know, if, if if, 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 if one of them were here and saying that we are willing to give you, um, you know, $500,000, maybe I could have changed the way I would support this. But as we speak, it's like this is the set price. They are unwilling to increase that. For me, I think this is very unfortunate. Don't get me wrong, and I think the money sounds excellent, but why can't we get more money out of it? Because it is their responsibility to provide the service that we need. And as of right now, it seems like they are unwilling to increase that $455,000. And for me, I think that's an issue. Why can't we get $500,000? Why can't we get $600,000? And I know you cannot answer for them, but I think it would have been excellent for them to actually come down here and talk to us. But saying that they are unwilling to come here, I think this is very disrespectful. Because as of right now, we are trying to, to make this deal work with them. And I think that... You know, that should have been their responsibility, truly. Well, well to Councillor, in, in prior times, there were a series of invitations that were issued to Aquaria that they did not comply with until they finally did, and that, that's, been, that's been recounted here. But on this particular issue, I don't think they've been invited. I don't think we've sent any issue. No, no, what I'm saying is that it's like, although, what I'm saying is that although, I mean, I can understand that we did not invite them, but given the intensity of this situation, and, and obviously they, 
I'm assuming based on the letter that you sent to them, they actually see how we, you know, how we, how we feel about this issue. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it would have been smart for them to actually come down here, and even if they were on the agenda, I would actually ask the, the chairman to allow them to speak. But the fact that they are not only unwilling to give us the money, but they're not even here. And I believe one of my, my, my colleague, Council Farrell, probably going to file a, a resolve to actually demand that they come down here. And I think when they come, I'll be more than happy to challenge them and ask him some tough questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> Council Fowell. Finish up with a question to Mr. Condon. 4.07 million gallons per day is the firm commitment. They have a right to bill us for that, correct? Yes. Okay. I but believe that, that that would be my interpretation. But, but yes. am I clear that we don't have the right to have them prove that they are entitled to the 4.07 million gallons per day unless we pay them to pump the money? That, that, would, be the, my, uh, the that water? would be my interpretation of the contract because the, I'd have to look at it again, but the fixed commitment volume yeah. is separate from the variable purchase amount. And then those are two separate sections of the contract. But uh, I'm not comfortable at this point offering my interpretation that ought to be offered by the attorneys on what those contract provisions mean. That's how I view it, but I'm just a uh, no, finance well, guy. Uh, Granted, I'm putting you on the spot, but you were involved in the two potential sales of, mm -hmm. of the, the plant. You've been involved in this. And I, I just want to be clear because I find this astounding that we can bid you for 4.07, but if you want us to prove we can do it, you've got to pay us to prove it. Well, I think. And I, I just, I, that just, can yeah. you see how mind boggling no, that I, is? I do understand it, but the, the intent of the fixed commitment was something different from the ability of the city to buy or not buy on any particular volume amount of water. And I think the default provisions, which we really have to look at carefully, you've got to have a failure to perform. And there isn't any failure to perform if they state that the investment's been made and the 4.07 million gallon capacity exists. We know they can get pretty close to it, and I'm not sure that they couldn't exceed it because we were only asking them when they gave us 3.99 or whatever that number was, we were asking, I think, for 3.8. So they were exceeding it then. I don't know, not an engineer, I don't know that they couldn't make it happen. I know they're concerned about how the pipe is fixed to the bridges on, the, on that point. But we won't know they're in default, I don't think, unless we force them to try to perform. That's my view. Maybe the city solicitor could give And the, mech one. the mechanism to force it's them divine. is something we'd have to discuss with our attorney yeah. and the solicitor. Yeah, I, I, I think I, so, Councillor. I, I guess my final comment uh, in response to my colleague from Ward 1 and, and uh, maybe Councillor Monaghan and Councillor Lally, there's an old expression, principles aren't principles without consequences. And I think because it's always easy to be principled if nothing's going to happen to you, you're not going to suffer any injury, no financial hit are you going to take. I think for some of us, this Aquaria thing has transcended just this amendment, and it's the issue of do we want the city of Brockton to be known as the community where you enter into a contractual agreement with us, we pay you faithfully, and then suddenly you reach a point where it appears, based on all of the statements made, you can't perform to the level of the contract, you don't even tell us. And that's the other thing that I hope all of my colleagues will remember. Who was going to tell us that Aquaria wasn't able to reach 4.07? Oh, oh Council, I think that was part of the asset purchase agreement, that the concern was that, that the plant as it existed at the time was not could able not, to could do. And, yeah. and it was part of the CDM report that as yes, right. currently right. configured, yes. they could do three and a half million gallons. And they've added pumping since then to get them to 3.81, but the concern of 4.07 existed several years ago. Yeah. Well, as I say, principles aren't principles without consequences. How we, as, if the consequence is $455,000 and they're in default, given all of the angst that this has caused our community and the people who live here, I think it needs further discussion with legislative council and whoever else wants to chime in. Maybe we'll have some attorneys file, what is it, an amicus uh, uh, brief or, or a letter and tell us what we ought to do because I'm not ready to just roll over on this. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had two, Mr. Connor, I just had two questions relative to uh, the letter that they sent you back into, you know, April 30th. They keep harping on the fact that they can't do any more, they can't do more because of the credit agreement. 
Did, to your knowledge, did they attempt to try to amend the credit agreement with I, Santander? I don't know. I don't. I just don't know the answer to that question, Council. Because that, I mean, I mean, we could certainly inquire yeah, against that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important to know. And I think Councilor Nicastro mentioned that some portion of the mortgage may have been paid, and so maybe these provisions are not going to be applicable to a year from now or two years from now. So. And the other thought was when, when and again, I, I had a family commitment, so I wasn't here at the FENCOM in April when you talked about this, but I guess the question is, they came to us looking for the amendment. No, actually, they came to us looking to not make the investment and not bill us. And those discussions, as I looked at the issue, I thought we'd be better off with a contract amendment which clarified all of this so that both parties' positions were, were more. My, my main concern, Council, wasn't so much at that point getting the money, but preserving the city's right in the case that we needed to to push them to get back to the 4.07. Was any, any conversation discussed given between the parties to actually shave years off the contract? Like to do no, an amendment wasn't, to, wasn't, to wasn't shave easy. years off the back no, end? No, that wasn't done. That's, a, that's another thought. That I mean, done. I think we should inquire into that. That would be a substantial savings. That would be a substantial savings. How many years are left on the contract? Until 2028, I think. 2028? I think so. I mean, I, I, I think that the city would, would really do a disservice if they didn't inquire those two mm -hmm. things. Number one, query, did you speak to Santander mm -hmm. about a credit agreement amendment? because that's what they happen on. Yes. And also, um, you know, would you consider shaving off X amount of years on the back end so the city could get out of the, con both parties would get out of the contract a lot sooner than. Yeah, so if we're going to pursue that, would the council be willing to trade the 4.07 for X number of years as opposed to 10 more years? Are you looking to Yeah, I just want to know if they, I mean, if they're going to say, you go pound there. sand, yeah. I mean, but I mean, I think we want to know that as part of our due diligence. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking to our legal counsel as well. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, well, thank that, you, that, that money is worth 4.5 million over 10 years, of 455,000, because it is right. at the moment a 10-year right. contract. Right. Right. So we might be able to convert a 4.5 million dollar benefit to something which is, uh, say, eight years in duration or seven years in duration. I didn't think of going at it in that fashion. Maybe you could shave. You'd still be saving over the term. I mean, not if you the, amortize not the, not the that, four and a half. No, the, but you know, if you amortize, you're saving a lot more in those last two years because it's, right. you're cutting it off. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilors, I think we beat it up uh, enough. My, my throat's getting dry. I need water. Um, <laughs> but in any case, where, 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 I, I got a little, I got a little, um, where are we going from here, Council? Motion been made and second to table. All in favor? Opposed? The item's been tabled. Next item. Resolved to invite Mr. Michael Gallerani, Executive Director of Century 21, B21, to discuss with the City Council <coughs> about the oh, Shaw sure. Center Campanelli Stadium renovation project for fiscal year 2018-2019. Invited, uh, invited Michael Gallerani, Executive Director of Century 21, B21. Councilors, this item here uh, was sponsored by I and uh, City Council and Beauregard from Ward 5, and as you know, some a uh, few months ago, she had put something before us in regards to wanting to know uh, interest in the uh, Campanelli uh, Stadium as well as the Shaw Center, so I did meet with Mike uh, Galliano uh, a couple of times in regards to uh, what is before us here. I did want him to stay on track to the fact that I think we have a problem within right now, then, then I know he wants to show us how we can move into the future, but I think we do have some issues that we need to take care of ourselves. Uh, with the uh, with the stadium um, right as um, as I speak to you because uh, it's 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 got I hate to say it but it has somewhat problems up there and, and, and they're trying to address it so uh, with that being said I'm going to turn it over and let uh, let Mike uh, take it from me and thank you for coming this evening thank you Mr. Chairman uh, Councilors before I even begin I'd like to um, to introduce you to Gold Andrews uh, Gold is a Boston Architectural College student that was part of a team that that did the uh, Campello design study, and I reached out to Gold because she's about to graduate in, on uh, May 25th. So a few months ago, I reached out to her because I was impressed with what she did for us on the Campello project, and her specialty will be interior design. So she's been working with, with our office uh, for the past few months doing interior design concepts for the Shaw Center, uh, which at least starts our conversation and we can start penciling in numbers based on that. So, and Gold is a Brockton High School grad, 
So uh, she is what is good about Brockton. There's no doubt about that. So just wanted you to welcome Gold to the to the meeting. And Gold's going to be my assistant tonight, running the. Go ahead, yeah, please. Um, we're going to start with a very short video um, that will show you when we talk about this potential uh, um, conceptual entertainment district. This video will. Um, Got it, Gold. The top line, Gold. Yeah. That's it. That. Yep. Okay. Step out of the way. <laughs> Is the sound on? Just to give you the context of this video, we had the uh, pleasure of meeting with Larry Lucchino and his team from the Pawtucket Red Sox um, several months ago to talk about the potential of their relocation to Campanelli Stadium. Um, they, it looks from all indications that they'll be staying, they'll be staying in Rhode Island, but the, the conversation we had with with Mr. Lucchino and his team was beneficial in a number of ways, and it also proved to us that Campanelli Stadium's value is, uh, is extraordinary. Um, he was very pleased with what he saw. He didn't honestly expect it. Your hands together. <laughs> um, again, that was that was a, a project that we did in, in anticipation of meeting with uh, Mr. Lucchino, and uh, I think it's appropriate to give you the context of when we talk about this potential entertainment district. Um, that that pretty much encompassed uh, the overview of it. Um, 
Gold, do you have the, uh, you can move to the ne next couple of slides. And I, I welcome interruptions and questions as we're going through this. You all received, I believe you received the packet uh, that, would, that, that would dug down deep and gave you a lot of information. This is a basic overview of that. I don't want to be a talking head that just repeats everything or reads this. Um, I, I'd rather have you ask questions as you, as you like. Um, this should be a conversation about where you think we are and where we should be going. Uh, I look for you to give me that guidance. Um, basically, basically, you can you, the, the understanding of it is the, for those of you that don't know, it was the facilities were built in 2002. Uh, the money came from the Commonwealth, the city, and uh, Mr. Campanelli, who gave, was generous, his foundation was generous enough to give us two million dollars. Uh, we are the owners. Um, but I think of us more as the stewards of the, of the facilities. Um, I, I genuinely believe that it's ours and, this, and, this, and through us, it's the cities. Uh, we have uh, the Shaw's currently does not have an operator because some of you may know on March 1st, we took back control after prolonged uh, negotiations with our current tenant on the stadium who also had uh, the conference center and after a, long and hard negotiations, we took control on March 1st. Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question, yeah. Mike. When you were saying you met with Larry Lucchino, I mean, it was my understanding that, because we looked at this many years ago to try to draw the, the Paw Sox to Brockton, we were told that there was a prohibition in a Major League Baseball because geographically, distance-wise, we're too close to Fenway Park and too close to Boston. Well, Larry Lucchino, I mean, it's the Red Sox, so they could, over, they could, they could embrace the team being that much closer. They, if it was the New York Mets farm team, you know, if it's Tidewater or wherever they are, wherever they are now, Norfolk, Norfolk. That, wouldn't, that wouldn't be able, you know, the Red Sox could protest. This one, the Red Sox, is, in Lucchino's mind, and the reason that they were willing to meet with us is that, yes. Really? They would consider it. Okay. But, but I don't think Rhode Island's going to let go. No. Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious they're not going to let go. Yeah. It was my understanding that the 21st Century Corporation was granted the authority by Mayor Units to, to manage the property. Are you saying that you are, in fact, the... There's no deed. You, you, but we you, act as the owner. You, you actually own it. We act as the owner. There's no, there was, it's, to my understanding, it, there was never any formal deed. You know, that proverbial selling it for the dollar? No. It's, there was never any deed? And it's always been... The, and and the, all the documents I've seen that I've been able to go through archives and find, uh, as well as get from City Hall, uh, okay. shows that there was a clear well, understanding that we were, we were acting as the owner of the property. And it yeah, even I'd, says I'd, that at some point that we own that between. Yeah, I'd, I'd want to look at all that paperwork, given the fact that the city has paid all of the, uh, the requirements. And the last thing I would say, Mr. Chairman, is I, I think there's a lot of meat in this presentation. One of them is that. B-21 wants us to forgive the outstanding balance on the original loan, and I think that's about six and a half million. And then they want six hundred thousand dollars of room tax revenue for the next ten years. Then they they want to retain all rent and shared revenue receipts, and that the city extend the land lease for twenty year period. I, I don't think we're going to get much done tonight. So I I just I caution us that I think there's a long way to go in this. Oh, exactly, there is. Thank you, Councilor Monahan. Yes. Um, you, got, you got rid of the operator that was running the Shaw Center? Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was, his relationship was with EMC, not with us. It was EMC that, that cut, cut their loss there and moved on. And, uh, okay, so they can no longer have some, they can no longer place somebody in there to run the Shaw no, Center? No, no. The lease, the lease has been bifurcated. We now, um, within the next couple of weeks, probably will be sending out the RFP inviting potential operators to bid. Uh, and there's some strict guidelines within that RFP in terms of pricing and obligations that they're going to have that were a little vague in the other agreement. And, and honestly, um, from 2002 till now, the agreement has always been you lease the stadium and you get the conference center. Uh, I just 
and from where I stand and where I sit, I think that was a bad business plan, and we've corrected that. They're two separate entities. To think and to assume that baseball people would be able to run a conference center, uh, the, the two don't match. It's possible, but it just it hasn't proven out for us the last few years. So it's going to be a I've separate entity, entity just, just basically functions here, not yes. wrestling matches? Yeah, that's, that's the intent. Yes. Did All that stuff like that, be in the stadium? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Council. Any other councils before he goes on to Council Borgard? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought there was you another council. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Huh? Chair, and thank you, <coughs> Mr. Gallerani, for coming. See, I read um, the package we received last Thursday, I believe, well, last Wednesday. And um, actually, I'm going to start from the back. I know that Mr. Chair wanted to concentrate on the uh, idea of the conference center this evening, but I did want to highlight this. Am I uh, to understand that anyone from the general public could see this report? Yes, I uh, okay. filed it with the town, with the city clerk. Excuse me. Okay, thank you. So those those of you um, who realize, like I said, I'm starting from the back because you know we have the whole source here where the sources are received for this information, rooms tax receipt offset. There's a chart here, positive po progress with plans and uh, what positive has taken place in the city in recent years as far as highlighting and focusing on the city both as entertainment and some more economic development. Then we get to um, this part here, and like I said, I started from the back here because it talks about renaming the region, the area of the Shaw Center as Center Plaza and breaking it down into specifics. And then it, it makes the following requests and recommendations, you know, to move this ag in an aggressive manner f toward the Campanelli Stadium and the Shaw Center. And one of them is, number one, to the city to forgive the outstanding balance, as uh, my colleague highlighted, and for the city to provide the dedicated revenue stream. And then um, the, the B21 retain all rent and shared revenues realized by both properties annually. And it is understood that this will be renovated in maintenance, insurance, and improvements. And then it continues to go on to highlight that uh, B21 will still pay 50% of um, the um, parking lot that they use during stadium events to the Broughton Public you know, Schools. And I'd like to know more about that because I know there's been in the past some discrepancy on it. And of course, somewhat biased here, very concerned about our schools. And then it brings up that the extending of the land lease and uh, to the year 2038. And then we talk about the city being responsible for monitoring and managing snow removal, et cetera. And again, you know, that we need to, you know, get, receive an annual report. And these are things that, you know, concern me. And like I continue to go on here as I read this, um, a little concerned. There's a breakdown of renovations and repairs. And I believe that this is what Mr. President wanted to look at this evening because there situations that we need to address. So I guess we're looking at hoping on discussing that. So just everyone realizes that this is all in here. Now, as far as the stadium is concerned, I believe that we should look at the two separately. And um, it talks about the state of facilities here and, um, you know, roof leaks, etc. And I know that this is what Mr. President um, wanted to highlight is how we can do something with the conference center and uh, know where we are with renovations and repairs because they appear to be extensive. So this certainly won't be resolved in one night, but I just want people to understand that they can read about this and because certainly it's been an enormous investment in our community and we were certainly hoping to benefit. I will say that there's a lot of vital information in here. This is a you know, pretty well done report here and there was some I would say discusses some misinterpretations and expectations of, um, but there are a couple of things to highlight, and one of them being here, public infrastructure projects invariably are not money makers. It is the role of the local government to invest in building, servicing, maintaining, and replacing. And I believe that that's, you know, certainly what we're looking for is to acquire some revenue from these investments. So I believe that this point, um, I am hoping, and I, I agree with my colleagues, that um, this is going to take more than at one meeting. And um, at, at this point, I'd like to 
suggest, um, Mr. President, that we table this? We, we can table it or postpone it to another finance meeting, whatever you wish to do. Um, there, uh, so if there's a second, we can't talk about right. it. But I, I, I'm there sure some of us have a, I have, I have a follow-up question. Because yeah. yeah. on, 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 this, on this, this proposed entertainment district map, they reference in this handout the EZF skating rink, which actually doesn't, isn't even within the, the map. I mean, it's outside of the map. Policimo soccer field, if it's sports, that should be included. I, I have a question relative to how a school, a public school, could be within an entertainment overlay district zone. So there's a lot of variables here right. that I think need to be addressed. And Mike, that's not even within what- Yeah, we, we, those lines, Yeah, we, we drew them in again. That was, we prepared that uh, in anticipation of that. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I, think, I think there's a lot to kind of and the reason, your teeth on. There's a lot in here. And, and the, thank you, you did a lot of due diligence on this. I appreciate that, okay. but- If I may, can I, the, yeah. school, the school's in there because of the parking lot. The parking is used for the stadium. So that was a question I asked Council yes. Cruz a second ago. So are we, are we meaning B21, are you up to date paying the public schools? Yes, yes. 100% has yes. been paid for parking? Yes, based on what we receive from, for revenue from uh, EMC, we get a payment from EMC. How do we split, split that it 50 -50? school? And is Chris English still involved? Yes. He is? Yes. I haven't heard from him in a long year. time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Council Rodriguez. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a quick question for you, Mike. I mean, I saw on the previous slide when you, you're asking for $6 million, $600,000, uh, all the askings that you have. Uh, I guess there's an old saying that goes, I see what you're asking for, but what's, but what, what's in it for me? And when I say what's in it for me, I'm talking about to the taxpayers of this community, where you know, you're looking at a ton of money, a ton of resources that you're asking to be allocated to you as B21. But honestly, I'm not exactly sure what we're getting for all of this. Okay. You know, I, don't, I honestly don't see it. Uh, I've always said since I've been sitting in this, uh, in this body, in a sense, <clears throat> We're always told what we can't do. You know, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. I understand that, you know, being a diehard, you know, Sox fan and stuff like that, that we can't really do much in terms of, you know, of asking a, a baseball team or so to come to Brockton because it contradicts with what the Red Sox are doing. When I last checked, the Red Sox haven't done anything in Brockton. Seriously. I haven't seen a single thing. The Patriots just came down. They did a beautiful park for us. I haven't seen the, the, the Red Sox have a nice foundation and you know, diehard fans everywhere. But I haven't seen a, a, a single thing that, that that team has done to Bro in Brockton. And we're probably the largest city closest to them. And there's a ton of us that actually travel into Fenway and we go up there on a regular basis and the, 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 the sports mobilia that we buy and all that other stuff, we are doing our part to help the team out. Uh, but they haven't done anything for us. So I actually have, as a fan, yes, but as a city council, I have no allegiances to the Red Sox. I don't. Because my job is to basically look and see what's in the best interest of the taxpayers of this community. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you, why is it that we could not there's a major rivalry, you know, rivalry between the Red Sox and the Yankees. Front. Can't stand them, by the way. But why couldn't we as a city, you know, basically go after some sort, you know, even if it's just for, for, to create a discussion, to create some noise out there, you know, to bring in some attention to our city, that we're trying to uh, basically try to get a, a minor league team into the community, to compete with the post, the post Sox, not, not, and actually not even the Post Sox, but maybe to compete with Lowell, because they've got a, a single A team up there. Why couldn't we get a single team in here from another uh, affiliate somewhere and let them go to court and fight it over? You know, because I am sure the mm -hmm. New York Mets or the, the Philadelphia Phillies or some of these other teams would love to take on the Red Sox and challenge some things. But we're, we're basically already doing our part and saying, oh, we can't do that. We can't, they won't do that. Oh, they will never do that for us. When in fact, well, we haven't even tried. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And we don't do a great deal of thinking outside of the box in the sense to say, let's take the initial step, let's put a bug in somebody's ear, let them do the fighting for us. But again, I want to, you can answer the second question when you feel like it, but I wanted to know, going back to my first question, basically, out of all of that, what's in it for the city of Brown? Well, let me answer the second question first. Um, Major League Baseball gives each team a geographic area that is theirs. No one, no one is allowed into that area within Major League Baseball. That means all affiliated teams cannot. So somebody from the, the Phillies couldn't come knocking and say, hey, we want to come here and we'll take on the Red Sox. Major League Baseball wouldn't even entertain the conversation. If the Red Sox say no, it's no. That said, yes, that's the way it is. Well, you know that too, right? Yep. Yankees have an affiliate in Virginia, and Phillies are right down the street from them. Outside the, outside the, outside outside the geographic Baltimore area. Baltimore is not that far away from We're, tw we're 26 yeah. miles to Fenway Park's door. I can tell you, we're 26 miles to the door. Well, what I'm saying so is that we are already asking, we are already selling ourselves short. No, we're not. I'm asking them to come in, even if it's for nothing but publicity. That's what I'm saying. You know? Well, Councilor Cruz. That's not a, it's an absolute under major league rules that they cannot possibly do it within a 50 mile area of the, the town. I'd like to see that, to be honest with you. I'll get you a copy of that. Thank you. And back to what we get for $5 million. I'll even take it the rest of the way. Never mind the 600000 a year. That's to pay the debt service on, the, on what I project to be the $5 million bond. Um, first and foremost, I think we go back to the original intent of why, of one of the reasons why the stadium and the conference center were built. Uh, the city um, was proud of it the day it was opened. I was not here. I was in Plymouth, but I remember when it, when it came online that this was, a, this was something good for Brockton. Um, I think we need to reach back and find that again. Have it be something that's very special the people from, you know, you'll see it. In, in, in the document, I talk about a one-hour drive. There's 2.7 plus million people in that one-hour drive that all have the potential to come here either for a conference, a business meeting, uh, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, an 80th birthday party, you name it. We have that potential to tell the Brockton story and be proud of the two facilities. Um, with, and even if they came for a game, it's also part of it as being a stadium. Uh, so it's very important that we make them the best they can be because people judge us, not just Brockton, but every city in town is judged by the thing that they're coming to visit. Um, we have the potential, and I think I said this early on, and I kind of said it jokingly a couple of years ago about the stadium and the uh, conference center and I compared it to my hometown, and you know, it was for Brockton, that's your rock and your boat. Those are the things that you have that can build a visitor industry that nobody else in the area has. Nobody else can say they have a conference center and a stadium adjacent to each other. Nobody else can really say, you know, in this general area, they have a stadium. Uh, and even conference centers, it's very limited. I think I provide you tonight with list of all the function and conference facilities in the area, including Boston. And the Shaw's actually is one of the bigger ones. There's some obviously in Boston that are much bigger. But that has the potential done right. And again, I will, I will give you this. It hasn't been done right the last couple of years. We've corrected that. Uh, and done right, it should be a place that people come from every different direction. Um, and use it, and it should generate enough revenue to be able to carry itself uh, instead of asking you every year to give us 125 or 150,000. That should be creating that revenue stream. And yes, six million, five million dollars is a lot of money. 600,000 commitment for 10 years out of the uh, rooms tax is asking for a major commitment, but it's an investment. It true, from, you know, from an economic development perspective, from somebody that's been very involved in visitor industry as an economic development uh, uh, sector, I can tell you it is, it's a pretty 
small investment to make to be able to create that, that industry. Um, the, the jobs that can be created, the tax revenue, just if, you, if we created through this entertainment district, three and a half, and I'll say three and a half, but meaning four hotels, that would generate in rooms tax that 500, that 600,000 every year, just in the rooms tax. The new growth real estate tax is, uh, just blank my mind, uh, I, I had it someplace, is, over 600,000 a year, if, you, if we were able to realize the hotel development that should go hand in hand with a very successful entertainment district. Now, that is not an entertainment district just, that just talks about two properties. That talk, that's thinking ahead and, and, you'll hear me say it, crush the box and think of the fairgrounds much differently than you think of it now. Whether it's with what the kind of development that's been proposed in the past couple of years, or just looking at it differently and thinking about the kind of uh, businesses that can be located on that site that would drive, again, destination marketing, uh, bringing in people with their money from other places, um, and taking advantage of that potential 2.7 million, million consumers that today is very limited how many of those uh, uh, would think about coming to Brockton. So, this would create that new, that new sector that we can build on. It's a very positive <coughs> sector. If you have a great in visitor industry, usually that means people are thinking very well of you. So, and that also um, spills out into, into business location and relocation because they've experienced the city, CEOs and decision makers experience the city in a variety of ways and think, okay, this is where I should look to, to, to locate my business. All right, Mike, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to just stop you at that level because um, we could go on and on and, and talk about the, the future. But, but I want to bring it around and about just for a couple of seconds, just to direct it back towards where are we today? In conversation that I had with you in regards to where we were with, with the Shaw Center, the situation of the facility in itself, um, even the stadium in itself, and knowing that we could probably be possibly spending somewhere about $1.5 million just to get that place in an operation mode just for this year and into next. And you did tell me that when we just had the Taste of Metro South, uh, which was held in April, not March, that you just painted the whole facility inside because it had to be painted because why? Because it needed to be painted. And there's other things that still need to be done. So I guess my take on it is, and I understand the future, and, and everyone right now in the city seems to be on a dream of whole economic development. What's it going to all be like in 10 or 15 years from now? I don't know. I could be pushing up daisies in Pine Hill Cemetery. I don't know. But I don't think it's all going to happen overnight. So my concern is where and how can we make money um, to the facility that we have today? I think that's my, my point and, and my goal. So, you know, I'm just throwing that out there just for a quick discussion. Then we'll have to probably postpone and, and, and dive into you know, further things with this, but, you know, where are we at today, I guess? Yeah. Let me talk about the two facilities I just separately. Wanna, yeah. The Shaw Center, everything we and done at the Shaw Center, including the painting, is done with intent. We have to market that to the, to the operators that we want to attract. Uh, painting it and using the taste of Metro South, painting in advance of the taste of Metro South, was strategic because we had restaurateurs as a captive audience. If they came in and saw it with you know, three different shades of green on the walls, holes all over the place, filthy, um, it wouldn't have made the kind of impression that we need to make to be able to grab the attention of those potential operators. Uh, and I will say that out of that, a couple of people have reached back and said they, they want the RFP when we release it, which wouldn't have happened if they hadn't experienced it at the taste. It, we, we would have had to work hard to get them to get interested, so that was money well spent. Uh, Infrastructure-wise, with that building, the roof is in deplorable condition. Uh, we had a major snowstorm in 2015. That damage was done to that roof when they removed the snow uh, that has to be corrected. 
you know, I can take you in there on a rainy day and you'll think you're outside in some of the areas because the water just pours through in certain places. So the roof needs to be done. The HVAC system on both properties is uh, on its last leg. We've been able to do enough reconditioning of it this year um, and everything has a price. So uh, we reconditioned it hoping to get through this year and hopefully into next year. But the reality is those, those HVAC units are gonna need to be replaced. The best time to replace them is when the roof's being fixed because they're on the roof. All, all in one. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's with regard to the shots. And it would be great if we could uh, renovate the restrooms in the in the shawls at the same time um, and the kitchen is going to need something we haven't determined that yet it needs a deep cleaning that um, we haven't contracted for yet uh, and but when that happens then we're going to find that we might have some equipment that needs to be replaced it wasn't well cared for the past couple of years I think everybody understands. You know, it was a very difficult couple of years, um, but we got there. We have now are at the place where we can move forward, whatever that is. But I, I ask you to consider the, the roof, the restrooms, and a set aside for that kitchen and replacing the floor. Because if you've been in there, you realize the floor is so filthy that there's no bringing it back to life. It's, it needs to be replaced. Um, beyond that, it's, we're moving things around, making better use of the space. I would love to activate the green space behind it that has been just this patch of lawn with a, with a tent on it since the beginning. And I think that has, that has the potential to be a, a generator of revenue for the operator to B21 and then obviously to benefit the city. So everything I'm looking at when I say all of this money, it isn't like it's coming to B21 to, to fund other projects. This is all to just keep regenerating economic development activity of the visitor industry within, uh, within the city. So, but okay. you know, it's, it's, that's an ex those are expensive facilities to maintain. I can tell you it's amazing how much money we go through um, on both of them. Um, the stadium, the stadium, the sprinkler system, again, is another one where we've invested some money uh, but the reality is at some point it's going to need to be replaced and the drainage system has some serious issues bad design from the beginning so we need to correct that and uh, they haven't been they weren't maintained for I don't know for how long but I'm now at the and I've we had them cleaned last year but that isn't enough you have to constantly do it uh, it's the nature of it, you know, it's a, it's a baseball field. So the runoff usually has dirt and other stuff in it. That clogs the drain system. The drains on the upper decks, if they back up, the decks get very slippery. So I really, you know, I'm thinking long term that that has to be coated with some non-skid. Uh, the rest of it is just making it look the best it can be. And that's, you know, that's some major redesign of the, the bowl of the stadium and, and the facade. But again, you're right. If that's, talk about that long term. If you, if you said, we'll wave the magic wand and the five million is available, you would create the timeline to say when it will all get done. If you said to me, no, there's a, there's a reality of uh, f some fiscal uh, decisions that I'd ask you that the roof, the HVAC, the restrooms, the flooring on the Shaw side, um, and the drainage, the sprinkler, the fire alarm, and uh, um, and I'd like to change it to the LED lighting so we can save some money on the other end because part of our budget every year goes to paying the light bill at the uh, stadium. Um, I did not negotiate the lease. So I have no ownership of it. Again, all right. So I'm we have sure. we have some we have some definite work to take a look at, and and, and yeah. that's that's what I wanted to find out. That's the one reason why we wanted you here tonight. But but that's not going to be cured in, in one night. So at this point, I mean, I, I don't want to carry on too much further because we do have the council foul. 
this issue of ownership and, and get back to us because yes. uh, I filed the order in 2016 which revoked B-21's authority over that property except with respect to the current agreement that they have with Mr. English and it would seem to me I wouldn't have been able to do that if they're the owner of the property. They can they could pretty much do whatever they wanted. And, and hearing this tonight, they could turn around and sell the property. And, we can, and I guess there's nothing we could do about it. Right. So I really think we need to nail down, particularly where the city dedicated all of those meals tax revenues to pay off the bond, who exactly. owns that property? Exactly. Uh, thank you. I, I, will, I will not disagree with you, and I will, I will um, sit down with, there's only one gentleman that can give me that clear, straight answer, and that's going to be Mr. Condon, because he was here through that whole process. So I will. Uh, I'll definitely uh, sit down with him and, and get that information back. Councilor Sullivan. Just to remind the council, I, and we never did receive it, but I had asked, uh, not Mr. Gallerani, I think it was Mr. Condon, for copies of the current mortgage of record and the deed of record. I specifically asked that, and I know we, we haven't received them, so maybe we could give him a gentle reminder on that again, because they do exist. Okay. That was just some time ago. Was it a year or so ago? Yeah, when, about when a year ago. Okay. Well, you were there then, I might yeah, yeah. A couple years ago. Yeah. So, with that being said, I'll just, um, Mike, I appreciate, appreciate everything you've done. Yeah, for you guys. And appreciate all the information you've given us this evening and even for the, uh, the little bit of a slideshow. But I think we've got some other work that we need to take a look at because in, in order for, for it to go forth, you gotta, we've got to see and take care of what we've got going now. Councilor Azak. Thank you. Just a couple of questions for go Mr. Gallerani. Thank you for the presentation and all the information you gave us ahead of time. I'm very happy to hear that we have a local resident here helping you. Gold, nice to meet you and thank you for... Uh, being here tonight. What is the capacity at the Shaw Center? Uh, seated around 650. Um, if it's in rows, if it's tables, it's uh, between 450 and 500, depending on okay. how tight you want it. And um, just a couple things. Was there any additional damages that were done with the last a uh, tenant that was there. Oh, tenant, yeah. That, so is there any, we, ha we haven't gone There's no after going them? After to him, no. no. And EMC uh, has agreed to pay some of the costs, but again, to be able to get to this point of getting complete control of the Shaws, um, it was in our best interest to move forward. And um, there was, but when you say damage, any, some cringe, it's, those three winter storms we severe, and the break-in. We, we should not go away without talking about the damage that was done when uh, the young people broke in and uh, did $80,000 worth of damage to the stadium. Um, we are chasing that through our insurance adjusters. Uh, we have a public adjuster um, and we're exploring every way to get, get that money, but Insurance company doesn't think it's it's eighty thousand, but the way that this tells me, you know, they pulled it. You just for those who don't know, they actually literally pulled the fire alarm out of the wall. Wow. Um, they tore the TVs out, and it was long gone. They they just made a mess. It just and it's that's that's eighty thousand dollars right there. Um, and we did we do know who they were, right? They, they four of them were arrested. There were fifteen to twenty. Arrested. Young people, four were arrested. Okay. Um, another, just something to keep in mind when you're really looking at all this. I know with, um, originally for the naming rights, there was the Shaw's, of course, yeah. and Campanelli Stadium, which is fine. But if we're looking to redo this um, venue and really rebuild it up and hope to get people from out of town, I would look and see what we could do about changing the name. I know I had heard many times, you know, brides say, and it's kind of odd to put the Shaw Center as a venue, so maybe we can look at just maybe changing or adding a name or something. Um, I met with the CEO of Shaw's last week just to check to see what their appetite was going forward. They have four more years in their agreement. They expressed to me, and it was the CEO and the marketing VP, they expressed an interest in negotiating a extension which is a good thing. Well, it is. They okay. also, I, had a, I asked them if their marketing team can work with us on the name. Shaw's would be in the name, 
Um, I'm not convinced that it should, should be, continue to be called the Shaw Center. I think it's, it's run its course, and um, there's a way to do it. And you see I keep referring to it as the Shaw's because that's how we talk about it. So, uh, but his marketing team will be working with us. Their marketing team will be working with us to, uh, to figure it out. And another th there's something else that came out of that is they have rights with their naming yeah. rights to use the facility. And you know, I pointed out to them that that goal is to have them want, want to use the facility, not just have the right to use it. And he looked at me and said, you do understand how many vendors and, and organizations we can help get to you. So that's, those are all the things that right now, that network is pretty much collapsed. And we have to rebuild that. And it will be the, the key of that is the operator and then how positive we have about the whole project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Lally. Right. I, uh, I just wanted to, just one quick thing, uh, just to add, I, I was speaking about it with Councilor Azak. Um, we've seen plans for downtown. We're seeing plans for, you know, the, the fairgrounds and the stadium area. Uh, Montello and the village, is there anything in the works for that? Are we going to see something like that? Uh, you know, this legislative session? Um, as you know, uh, that's something that comes more out of planning and economic development. Yeah. Uh, I'm on a team that, involved, that includes Rob May, Shane O'Brien, uh, Bob Jenkins, and, uh, and, and George uh, Durante. Um, and this morning, actually, I brought it up and said, where are we with these other pieces of it? And th those are all the next steps. The, you know, that's, that process is moving. Um, we will be looking at all of those. Um, there's some more progress we need to make with downtown so we can have something to build on. Um, um, what I've been doing as B20 wish try to move the starting line. Uh, we, as I said, we used Boston Architectural to do a design study. I had another grad student that was available to do some design work of the different buildings downtown. We'll be looking at in the future, being able to take another look at other in buildings in both Campello and in Montello, uh, more specific to the buildings and what their potential is, so that when we work to bring in a developer, here's where we're starting instead of everybody talking about something. And, four different people having four different ideas, at least we will have a starting point. Uh, we also had MIT come in and look at five buildings downtown and do a study on um, where the financing gaps would be, and that's, that's crucial too when trying to attract the right developers. Uh, so those avenues will continue as we go into the other parts of the city, um, and the beauty of it is usually the cost is pretty attractive to have, and like I always say, we won't be able to afford these people six months later because they'll graduate and, and then they'll have private fee rates. And uh, so right now we take advantage of every chance we get. And uh, Are there any other uh, councilors, any other questions? Do you have a motion, uh, Council Beauregard? Or? Before to table it, and then it was suggested that you wish to postpone it. Yeah, well, we postpone it, then I can find out other information pertaining to the ownership and everything. So we'll postpone it to a finance meeting probably sometime in the summer. How's that? Second. 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 Motion been made and second. We're going to postpone it to a July finance meeting. All in favor? Opposed? Postpone it until July. Thank if you. The, if there's anything specific, you need from me prior to that, and you'd I'll, I'll like let it you, in advance. I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, I gotta, I'll I've got to find out some, some work they want me counsels, to do. You know, I'll I let can, you know. Yes. I'll get it all and then share it. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very Any much. Any moments of personal privilege? Oh, Council. Personal privilege, Mr. Council of Salt, we'll go right ahead. My youngest son, William, a happy sixth birthday, Yay. Wednesday, May 9th. <laughs> He's the clone of Bob Sullivan. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, Council Borgard. Thank you. Uh, Thank I, you. First of all, I wanted to mention that they had an extremely successful cancer walk 
and um, you know, with Signature Healthcare, Broughton Hospital, and Sullivan Tire, with many, many people there. I saw Council Rodriguez leading a group, and he actually walked from Broughton High to the hospital, and uh, they ended, of course, at the New Cancer Center. I also mention all the time that there are positions available on various boards and commissions. People can feel free to call me and I can give them the information, 774-297-4939. And I will be having a ward meeting, Ward 5 meeting, on Tuesday, May 22nd in downtown Broughton at the Broughton Main Library, 304 Main Street, uh, beginning at 6.30. And this, I will be joined, fortunately, by Representative Jerry Cassidy. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Mm -hmm. Councilor Derencourt. Yes, you may. Excellent. Um, I would like to invite all our city residents um, to a Haitian Flag Days that will be on May 17 at City Hall. And um, it will begin at 9.30 to 12.30. And it's in collaboration with the Haitian community partners and SHUP. I would like to invite all my colleagues, if you do have some time, to stop by and um, let's have some fun in our city. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council Rodriguez. Yes, sir. Tuesday. Go ahead. Yep. So real estate meeting will be next Tuesday. It'll be the 15th of uh, May 15th at 6 p.m. Um, in City Hall basement, right? Yes, okay. Councilor Azak. Mr. Chairman, a moment of personal privilege. Yes, you may. I would like to remind everybody that um, Brockton High School Drama Club is putting on the musical 9 to 5 this coming weekend. Um, the first show is Friday, May 11th, and um, Saturday, May 12th. Showtime is at 7 p.m. And then on Sunday, May 13th, showtime is 6 p.m. I hope everyone will come out and support our award-winning drama club. Um, every year they, they amaze me, and I know they amaze many people in the audience. Every year gets better and better, so I hope everybody comes out and supports them. And uh, it's a great, uh, on Sunday, it's a great way to bring moms out. and. Um, Wish them a happy Mother's Day, bring them out, and um, enjoy the, a nice show. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Councilor Cruz. Uh, thank you, moment of personal privilege. Yes, sir. I was actually remiss at the beginning of the meeting tonight. I wanted to ask for a moment of silence. This past week, we uh, lost a great guy, uh, husband of former Ward 1 City Councilor yes. Marty Kroll, but more importantly to most of us, we knew him as the custodian of City Hall for many years. Bill Kroll passed away. He was a great guy. Always had a great word for you, and uh, we're, we're going to miss him, and our thoughts and prayers go out to the Kroll family. Take a moment of silence, why don't we? May you rest in peace. He was Thank a you. good guy. Councilor Sullivan. President, again, if I could have a moment of personal privilege, I wanted to, uh, first of all, congratulate the Brockton Historical Society for the uh, unveiling of the uh, Moosehead Lake Memorial nice. on Saturday. It was well attended. I know you were there, and, and Councilman Castro, and Beauregard, and Farwell, and myself, and Lally, um, and maybe some others, but very well attended by elected officials, residents, and more importantly, relatives of those 10 people that were lost 90 years ago. It was, it was a very uh, moving day, and also really a good tribute to our friend Jim Benson, who passed on the 18th of April. Uh, it was, it was Jim would have liked that day. It was really a, a, a nice day, and if you weren't able to get up there, it's a great memorial, get up there. Uh, and a couple hours later, I went over to Cardinal Spellman, and I want to thank Council Beauregard and State Rep. Jerry Cassidy for supporting Trinity Catholic Academy's first drama performance of The Wizard of Oz. You didn't make it, go next year. It was awesome, and I'm very biased. I thought the 10 Men was the best, uh, but again, it was, uh, it was a great day, and, and kudos to all those kids at Trinity Catholic Academy. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else, counselors? Reminder, next Monday night, right here at 7 p.m. for City Council meeting. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>